Here I am again in the name of the Sovereign Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are continuing with my exposition of my translation of Acts. We have come to chapter 9, verse 31. The last time we finished out the question of Saul of Tarsus. And now today we will begin with Peter's <coughs> ministry. But first, verses 31, just the verse 31. So then the congregations throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were built up and proceeding in the fear of the Lord and in the enabling of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. I have to comment one textual question here. You may have noticed that I read, then the congregations, plural. Maybe your Bible says church singular. Well, 8% of the Greek manuscripts have church singular, and so you'll see that in the NIV, NASB, LB, TEV, etc., and so on. But all the 92% the of the manuscripts and the best line of transmission have it in the plural, which I think is important to emphasize. There were a variety of different congregations scattered around the whole area, and I take that to be the point here. It says here that they were proceeding in the fear of the Lord and in the enabling of the Holy Spirit. I wonder, does the Holy Spirit enable those who do not fear the Lord? Maybe fearing the Lord is a prerequisite. Now we go to verse 32. I'll read 32 through 35. Now it happened, as Peter went through all those parts, that he also went down to the saints who were living in Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed. He had been lying on a pallet for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Messiah is healing you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he stood up. All who were living in Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Your translation says, Peter saying, Aeneas, Jesus, the Christ, which is, of course, what the Greek text says. But since Peter was speaking Hebrew, I took the liberty of putting Messiah instead of Christ. But the Greek text is, of course, Christ, Jesus, the Christ. Isn't it interesting that Peter told him to get up and make his bed? <laughs> well, you know, it had been eight years since the last time he could make a bed. So he probably did it with great pleasure. He was really happy to be able to make his bed. <laughs> when we read here in verse 35 that they turned to the Lord, the idea is of a change of direction in belief or course of conduct. The turning is a serious turning in lifestyle. So now we go on to the case of Dorcas. So I will read verses 36 through 43. Now there was a certain disciple in Joppa named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds that she kept doing. But it happened in those days that she took sick and died. So when they had washed her, they placed her in the upper room. Now Lydda was near Joppa. The disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. So Peter got up and went with them. Upon arriving, they took him up to the upper room. All the widows stood around him, weeping and showing the coats and garments that Dorcas was making while she was with them. So Peter put them all out, kneeled down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, get up. So she opened her eyes, and upon seeing Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her a hand and lifted her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with a certain Simon, a tanner. When it says here that they placed her in the upper room, that's the upper room of her own house. She was presumably reasonably well off if she had a house with a second story on it. It was up a room in her own house, probably her bedroom, actually. Now, 
the the brothers there knew that Peter was nearby, so they sent to get him. Now, poor Peter. <laughs> he comes in and he's surrounded by all these widows crying and showing the clothes. It says here that really Dorcas was making. That's what the text says. And I get the impression that Dorcas may have used a production line method, which left a variety of unfinished garments. Anyway, Peter couldn't hear himself think, much less hear the Holy Spirit. So he had to say, please, everyone, get out. <laughs> he put them all out, kneeled down and prayed. She sat up. She'd been dead for a number of hours. We don't know. I don't. Uh, I didn't check to see just how far Lydia is from Joppa, probably not too terribly far, but even so, she'd been dead for a number of hours, probably. Well, you can be sure that that really was a blessing to everyone there. They were happy to have her back. Now we come to chapter 10, the case of Cornelius. And this one is what we may call a watershed event. I will read verses 1 through 8 for starters. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. <coughs> devout and fearing God with all his household, both giving alms generously to the people and praying to God about everything. About the ninth hour of the day, in a vision, he, he saw clearly an angel of God entering his presence and saying to him, Cornelius, well, staring at him and being frightened, he said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and summon Simon, who is surnamed Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. So when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who were faithful to him. And explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. See, this is just setting the background for what's going to happen. But let's just um, clear up a possible doubt or two here. But I, I would like to make a practical application on what's stated at the end of verse 2 here. It says that that man, Cornelius, prayed to God about everything. <laughs> hey, how about us? Do we pray to God about everything? Yeah, that's pretty good, you know. That's pretty good. That was a that man was really serious. The ninth hour of the day in Jewish time, that would have been 3 p.m. That was one of the two established Jewish hours of prayer. That was uh, nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, you can judge from what the what the uh, angel says that. Cornelius was different. He was not just an ordinary person. So much so that God was going to give him a special dispensation. Send to Joppa. Get Peter. He's with a tanner whose house is by the sea. If you use the AV or the NKJV, that you will see he will tell you what you must do. That comes from the Texas Receptus which here is based on just a very few late manuscripts plus part of the Latin tradition. Why do you suppose the tanner's house was by the sea? <laughs> I don't know. Nowadays, it's not easy to find uh, a, uh, a local tanner. But I have been one. I have been near one when I was in Bolivia. And I can tell you that it doesn't smell all that great. <laughs> a, tanner, a tannery is not a nice place to be around. It does not have a pleasant smell. No wonder his house was by the sea. But I'm, I find it curious that Peter would actually stay at a place like that because, like I say, the smell wasn't all that great. <laughs> I have been there. I mean, I've seen it. I've smelt it. <laughs> okay, so what does he sends? Evidently, he sends three men, two of his household servants and a devout soldier. He explains everything to them and sends them hot-footing it to Joppa. 
So, verse 9 through 16. In the meantime, God is preparing Peter. Now, on the next day, <laughs> as they were traveling and drawing near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray at about noon. Well, he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were preparing, a trance fell on him, and he saw the heaven opened and a container like a great sheet descending to him. It was tied at the four corners and was being let down to the earth, <coughs> in which were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, open parenthesis, both wild animals and reptiles, close parenthesis, and birds of the sky. Then a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, slaughter and eat. But Peter said, No way, Lord, never have I eaten anything common or unclean. So the voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, you must not call common. Well, this happened three times, and then the object was taken back up into the sky. I read about noon. Actually, the text says the sixth hour, which would have been Jewish time. But it was, in fact, about noon. And he's hungry. Now, the... I have to tell you, honestly, that verse 12 is a little difficult to translate. What the text actually says, literally, if I were going to give a straight, literal translation, it would be something like, all the four-footed of the earth, and the wild animals, and the reptiles, and the birds of the sky, like a rerun of, Adam, of Noah's Ark. Well, from Peter's response, however, it appears that there were no clean animals or birds in that sheet. I am tempted to translate all the four-footed of the earth dash, that is, wild animals and the reptiles dash, and the birds of the sky, wherein the birds of the sky would be carrion fowl. Know that songbirds and game birds generally stay pretty close to the ground. It's the buzzards and other, you know, hawks and eagles and whatnot that are way up in the sky, and they are carrion fowl and therefore may not be eaten or could not be eaten. Under Moses' law, they were unclean. And Peter is not about to do it. <laughs> no, thank you. When it says here common, that means <laughs> it was ritually or ceremonially and impure and therefore could not be eaten. Well, it happened three times. Now we'll read verses 17 through the first half of 23. Now, as Peter was really perplexed within himself as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, well, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having inquired and found Simon's house, stood before the gate, and calling out, they, inqu they inquired whether Simon, who was surnamed Peter, was staying there as a guest. So as Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Listen, some men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So going down to the men, Peter said, Yes, I'm the one you are looking for. For what reason have you come? So they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by an angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. So he invited them in and put them up. There's nothing much to comment on here. It's quite straightforward. <clears throat> Again, verse 21, uh, if you read the AV or the NKJV, you will have who had been sent to him from Cornelius. This time you have about 35% of the Greek manuscripts. But the 75% includes the best line of transmission that I follow, so I did not. Translated. Doesn't make any difference. Most versions tell you that the angel was holy. The best line of transmission doesn't have the word, which is why I don't put it. But of course, if the angel is giving instruction from God, obviously it is a holy angel. Well, there's about, as I recall, there's about 60 kilometers between Caesarea and Joppa. Okay, so those, those three men, they started out after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And they were arriving about noon the next day. Well, you know, they probably 
did a fast trot in much of the night because they are tired. They are worn out. They have done 60 kilometers in 21 hours, something like that. <clears throat> so what does Peter do? Well, he puts them up. He invites them in, puts them up, even though <laughs> it wasn't his house. But as an apostle, he could probably... But of course, in those days, hospitality was, you know, absolute. Every, you just had to be hospitable. You just didn't think about sending someone away. So it would be perfectly normal and natural, even for the owner of the house, Simon the Tanner, to put these guys up for the night. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Let's go on and read the second half of verse 23 and up through verse 29. The next day Peter set out with him, as also some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. We know from verse chapter 11, it's verse, there were six of them, I think. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and having called together his, his relatives and close friends. So when Peter actually arrived, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And conversing with him, he went in and found many gathered there. Then he said to them, You know how it is unlawful for a Jewish man to associate with or to approach a different race. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, also, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. So I ask, for what reason did you send me? They would have made probably about 45 kilometers because Peter and these other men, they are, they are dignified Jews. They are not going to run. They set a steady pace, but they probably would not make, as a matter of fact, they did not make 60 kilometers in one day. They spent the night somewhere, probably had to <clears throat> finish off 15 kilometers or so the next day, so they would have arrived in Caesarea probably just before noon, sometime, probably. Now, it says Cornelius was waiting for them. Let's try to get the feel of the, <laughs> this, this is a watershed, a watershed event. We, we want to understand it. I'm going to take some liberties, try to, try to fill in the, what's in between the lines here. Cornelius is a Gentile, but he really wants to know God. Yet he knows that Jehovah has a thing with the Jews and isn't too big on Gentiles. But he is convinced that Jehovah is the true God and is doing his very best to please him. So one day, God gives him a special dispensation of grace. He sends an angel. Hey, was Cornelius excited, or was he excited? Like He sends his message, his mes he sends his mes sorry, I'm not doing it. He sends his messengers, hot-footing it to Joppa, 60 kilometers, and they do it in less than 24 hours. So what does Cornelius do while he waits? He prays and fasts. Surely, he, has already, he was already a man of prayer, verse 2. He prayed about everything. So now, how is he going to show his appreciation to God for this special favor? He fasts. Now that he has God's attention, marvel of marvels, he wants to stay tuned in so as not to miss anything. After allowing for the minimum of time necessary for the round trip, he's at the door looking down the road. Oh, well, probably being a military commander, he sent some soldiers to some lookout to see when the group appeared and be able to give him information about that. So, enter Peter. He lays on the bit about Jews not contaminating, not contaminating themselves with Gentiles. But God told him to come. And so what does Cornelius want? <laughs> now it is his turn, that is Cornelius. He is looking at a Jew who is not exactly oozing enthusiasm at being there. But he is Jehovah's messenger. And the centurion understands about rank and authority. So he plays the only cards he has, his own sincerity and seriousness and God's revealed will. 
Just in passing, unfortunately, some 3.5% of the Greek manuscripts omit the fasting, as in NIV and NSV, etc., etc. It's too bad. The text actually has fasting. But I got, this is in verse 30, which I haven't read yet. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Now let's read verses 30 through 33. So Cornelius said, I have been fasting during 40, sorry, I have been fasting during four days until this very hour. Yes, it was the ninth hour. I was praying in my house when, wow, a man stood before me in shining clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your, your alms are remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and summon Simon, who is surnamed Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Upon arriving, he will speak to you. So I sent to you at once, and you did well to come. Now then, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded to you by God. Okay, what I said about the fasting, that's here in verse 30. I have been fasting. Okay, the text has fasting, even if your Bible doesn't have it. Till the ninth hour. Oh, no, no. I was fasting four days until this hour. And he goes on, it was the ninth hour when I was praying. I will attempt to reconstruct what happened. He says four days. Okay, let's see if that's true. I've been fasting during four days, he said. Verse 3, we have the first day. Cornelius sees the angel. It's about 3 p.m., and he sends messengers forthwith. Verse 9 gives us the second day. Peter has the vision about noon, and the messengers arrive and were lodged for the night. Verse 23 gives us the third day. Peter and company leave Joppa. Verse 24 gives us the fourth day. They enter Caesarea, probably before no. Now, by Western reckoning, we have not quite three full solar days. But by Hebrew and Brazilian reckoning, we have a situation that involves four days. And Cornelius, talking to a Jew and understanding about those things, probably put it like Peter would understand. Four days. During four days. That's the way... A Jew would look at it, and that's the way Brazilians look at it. Let's just remember what happened. Uh, the messengers under urgent orders did the 60 kilometers in less than 24 hours. Peter was not about to be stampeded into action. He had to eat, sort things out in his mind, talk it over with the others. Since they decided to send a committee, preparations had to be made. So they set out the next day, but they're dignified Jews. They're not going to run. They may have done, say, 45 kilometers, stop for the night, and then they do the rest the next day. So when, when Cornelius says this very hour, he is talking about the moment that Peter arrived. That's the point of that reference. Now I call attention to the second half of verse 33. Now then, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Cornelius does not beat around the bush. He wants to hear from God. And he did, as a matter of fact, as we will see presently. 